When I was a kid, uh, I used to spend a few months per year on a sailboat. That's where I developed my connection to the ocean. And on the side of that, uh, I was spending a lot of time in books. I could see fishes and sharks and whales, and I was telling stories in my head. And then a bit later, I, I finally could get in the water and start to discover all these animals I was seeing in the books. And that was the beginning of my journey. I'm a free diver. Uh, that's how I can describe myself, but that englobes a lot of different things. But uh, the guideline and uh, what always drove me through my life is free diving. Usually every year I spend around 200 to 250 days in the ocean. And then when I'm diving, some days it's one or two hours, but some days it can be uh, six, seven, eight hours, nine hours. And um, I never get bored. I mean, I can go in uh, two meters of water near a beach and, and find uh, stuff that will, I will be like totally fascinated for, for two hours. And on the other hand, I can go to the other side of the world and uh, discover a new ecosystem I've never been to and I will be as fascinated. And that's something I don't really have on land. Um, I probably get bored more quickly on land. Uh, free diving for me is a tool uh, to discover yourself, to discover others. When I was a teenager, I was free diving during the summer uh, with friends, uh, spear fishing and all that. And of course, as every kid, you try to hold your breath for longer and longer, like everybody in the world has done. Huh? You, know, you just go even in your bathtub, you hold your breath. And in those days, what we were doing when we were practicing, we were not very far from the records. Uh, back then. In 96, the idea was to put divers, free divers together and do a competition like any other sport. It's absolutely not an extreme sport. People see it as an extreme sport, but we go so slowly and we put so much time in the progression that your body is very adapted. We have to ban anything that stresses us. Uh, there's no adrenaline. Uh, if you're not ready, you don't go. I mean, it's a very, very calm and quiet activity even though it requires energy and you need to be trained, uh, the dive itself, it's a, it's a very peaceful moment. Okay, so have a look. In fact, the, the pressure uh, in free diving, you feel it um, less and less the deeper you go. Uh, the first 10 meters, there's a lot of change in your body because you double the pressure from zero to 10 meters. So you really feel it a lot in the ears, the lungs compress, uh, everything change. Then from 10 to 20, a bit more, but I would say after 50, 60 meters, you don't really feel the change much because your lungs are crushed to the, the, the maximum they can be crushed. You have plasma filling the alveole, so you don't feel the pressure anymore on the chest. It's just the ears, you still need to equalize, but uh, you, you can really go into a very meditative uh, state of mind. It's, it's very peaceful down there. Uh, all the accident in free diving, 99% uh, of the people who died in free diving, actually they were free diving alone, on their own, not in a competition, uh, like doing things like spear fishing or collecting uh, selfish and things like that, and going alone. In competition, there was one fat fatality in all competitions since uh, and record attempt since uh, like 60 or 70 years. Freedivers die because they go alone, they have no idea, 
and uh, they drown alone on, on their own. And, uh, and that's something it's very difficult to change. You need to change the mindset. Uh, they think they know everything and because they've been doing it for 20 years alone and then one day they have a blackout and they die. And uh, I've lost friends like that uh, because uh, people think they're always uh, going to be uh, uh, okay, uh, like you hear a lot, you know, a spearfisher was able to dive and, and spearfish at 20 meters, for example, he goes alone and you give him shit because he goes alone and he tells you, yeah, but you know, when I'm alone, I stay at 12 meters maximum, but you never know. On that day, you're tired and then uh, you come up, you black out and then uh, it's finished. The most difficult thing is to combine the training uh, all the, the media and sponsor uh, aspect and uh, your daily life and to, to mix everything up. Uh, the thing with freediving, it was a very new sport. There was no money in the sport. There's still no money in freediving. So you had to make the best out of it. So you had to do basically everything by yourself. So somehow the most easy part was to do very deep dive and records and everything. That was the easy part. The difficult was to put everything together to achieve that. As an athlete, you are progressing, going deeper, trying to find ways to go deeper and overcome the, the, the problem to go deeper. But also we were organizing the sport, uh, that thing that was just an activity, as a real sport with all the codes, the, the rules, the teaching system, how to teach people, how to be freedivers. So it was a very interesting era. And that was like from 95 uh, until 2000. And my first record, uh, was uh, 51 meter constant weight in fresh water. So it means going down with the fins, coming up with the fins. That's always the discipline I like the most because it's what you can translate into real life free diving. You know, if you go take pictures, that's the way you do it. Huh? With your fins, you go down and up. And uh, otherwise I won the F world championship in 99 in constant weight with a dive at 60 meters. Just to give you an idea, that was in 99. And nowadays, the world championship, the best divers are diving around 120, 130. So uh, the depth doubled in the last 20 years. But basically, every year is the same. You know you're going to train for eight months, uh, go to the gym every day, go to the, the pool every day, run, cycle. And then at the end of the year, you do more free diving and then you get to the competition. You have one dive, you do your dive and it's done. And then you take one and a half months off and you start again. So after a while, after five, six, seven years, it's getting a bit boring. And that was my exit door. And the transition happened naturally because two years before I stopped competing, I bought my first underwater camera. The idea was just to take some pictures of the competition of the friends as memories. And uh, I never intended to, to become a photographer. And the thing is, very quickly, the first picture I took on competition, magazines start to be interested and start to, to buy them because they had a very different look because it was the first time a freediver was taking picture of freedivers. Usually it's scuba divers taking picture of freedivers. And the mindset is very different. Freediver has a more wide angle type of vision and uh, scuba diver is more focused on details. Getting the underwater camera is always um, a special moment because it's a normal camera that you put in a housing and you have to be uh, very careful uh, to be sure everything is waterproof. So you have to take your time. You cannot rush to do that. You need to check if everything is okay. Uh, because when I close the housing, I know it's closed until uh, I get out of the water. And uh, so it's better to check before and not have a bad surprise and get water in it. If there's water in it, it's, it's finished. So uh, it's always like a little ceremony. I've ended my uh, professional career as a freediver in 2004. I already had something. So that was a very easy transition and very natural transition. And I was super lucky to have that. And, uh, and then I could embark on the, the underwater photography journey, but full on, still using freediving.
Naturally, when I bought the first camera, I had a very wide angle on it. I never wanted to take light or anything. I wanted to capture as much landscape as I could. And if you see my picture, most of them, you have little subject, the, the free diver, the animals are quite small in the picture. And I like to have a lot of negative space because I think that's how you project your mind and people can, you know, dream or have, tell themselves a story. And of course, what helped me also is that with the artistic background in the family, although my father was a photographer, but he stopped his career as a photographer way before I was born. Uh, I had a grandfather that was a, a painter, but uh, he, was, he died before I was uh, five years old. So, But I think being in that kind of background with picture on the walls and stuff probably, you know, is doing something to your mind. And also is the open-mindedness. If you see diving magazines, the picture are the same since the 70s until now. Technique evolved, better cameras, better light. People travel to crazy places so they can find different animals and creatures, but it's the same. Very colorful, very narrow, and that's what divers like. But why do they like that? It's probably because we only give them that. Uh, ideally, uh, a photographer should never follow or go after the, the subject he wants to picture. He needs to wait there and have the thing happening in front of him. And uh, that's what I try. So I always try to get the animal curious, which means, uh, you know, you turn your back, uh, you go a bit away, and you come back and you go away again. And they, there's always a moment where it gets interested in what you do. And then you have a few seconds to, to take your shot. I think for human beings, stories are important uh, because story uh, always been driving civilization, individuals, groups. Sometimes I collaborate with uh, the publisher of Tintin and uh, we do uh, underwater reports. So I talk, I do blog articles and small articles about uh, underwater exploration. And for me, to be able to work with these guys is just, you know, a childhood dream. And then the funny thing is that two, three years ago, uh, I became myself a comic book character. So uh, that's a, a kind of a funny story. It's Michel Vaillant is a racing driver. Uh, it started in the late 50s and it's still going now. now. So in the book, I take him uh, on a free diving course, uh, teach him how to hold his breath. And then uh, the last surprise is that uh, I take him offshore and uh, I take him uh, free diving with sharks. So uh, he can really overcome his fear. And uh, then at the end of the book, during the race, he remembers uh, not being afraid of the shark because if you're afraid of the shark, the shark will come at you. You need to, be, to overcome your fear. And so that helps him to, to overpass. So it's, it's funny to come from a comic book background and then finally ending up in a, in a comic book. It's a cool story. When I started underwater photography, I was always looking for stories. Uh, so it was uh, first uh, freediver stories, and then quickly you understand that uh, trying to follow the work of marine biologists is a very good story because they always do a lot of different things with the animals and you can tell a full story and build up an article. So I started to, to reach out to marine biologists to, to go on the field with them and document their work because freediving is a very uh, discreet way of going in the water. You, know, you don't make noise because you don't blow bubbles. The bubbles make noise and scare the animal away. And as a free diver, you can really go slowly. The animal accepts you, they're not afraid. So you can approach them very well, for example, to place a tag or to do photo identification and things like that. And that's why I love photography, because with one frame, you can tell a story. I mean, you tell a story, but also the viewer can tell his own story because you know, you see a picture, you can interpret it in many different ways. You see that in the media. You see a picture of a freediver with a shark, for example. For some media, it will be, oh, uh, a diver almost killed and eaten by a shark. And the exact same picture, you put another sentence under, a uh, human and a shark peacefully interacting uh, in a beautiful ocean. And it's totally different vibe, but the picture, it's exactly the same. It's the same happening in the news. It's the way you tell the story that will determine what people will think about it. So that's a, a cool illustration. Uh, it's a little uh, print, but I like the concept because, you know, I'm, I'm from what I call the, the Jaws generation because I grew up with that movie. I was four or five years old when 
the movie was out. And a lot of people, uh, because of that movie, became fascinated by the sharks or totally afraid of the sharks. On my side, I was drawn into sharks and getting more interested by sharks after that movie. But it left something into the unconscious of a lot of people born uh, in those years. And uh, so th that illustration, it's fun because it's a great white shark. And inside the great white shark, you have Quinn, the, the hunter, the, the fisherman that tried to catch the shark. And in the movie, he gets eaten by the shark before succeeding uh, catching it. And uh, I think the illustration name is called Quint's Revenge. And uh, I thought it's a good, uh, good image of, of what we can think of sharks. Is it a monster or is it uh, an animal that's uh, very useful to, to the ocean? It's again a question of perspective. How do you look at it? How do you see it? I think fear of something comes from the lack of knowledge. Humans have the, the primal fear. We are afraid of the cold, the darkness, uh, the wild animals. Why? It's because when we were uh, in the good old days, what was dangerous it was night, it was uh, being cold and dying of cold, it was the, the, the deep sea, it was the animal hunting you down. So our brain have been wired to be afraid of that. Nowadays, we know uh, the sea, we know the animals. So if you do your homework and you gradually get exposed to that, you won't be afraid anymore because you see it's not dangerous. And our worst enemies as humans is the lack of knowledge. Uh, that's why humans are racist, because they don't know their neighbors. Uh, that's why uh, humans are greedy, because uh, they're always afraid of uh, not having enough. It's, it's always that. It's the lack of knowledge that drives to bad behavior uh, as human beings. Going at sea, it's exactly the same. Why people, when they swim, they're afraid of uh, what's un under them is because they have no idea of what's under them. So they're afraid. You spot it first? It's you? Who spot it first? Okay, so you have to go uh, alone in the water with it. <laughs> Usually we see uh, throughout the season, you see the same sharks. Not always, but uh, sometimes you have new ones, but there's some that you see uh, throughout the summer and sometimes even years after years. They, yeah, you recognize because they all have different scars and the shape change a bit, you know, it's like humans. Uh, we all look the same. Uh, to an alien we would look the same, but you know, for us we can recognize different human beings. For me, the decision to, to come and spend more time here in Azores uh, happened because at some point in my life I was like traveling 11 months per year. So you start to question yourself. Uh, if you want to be away from home 11 months a year, it's not only because you like traveling, it's probably because you're bored of the place where you live. So uh, I question myself and say, okay, I need to be closer to the ocean. I need to be in a, in a more quiet place, in a place where I can uh, really do what I want all year round when I'm not on, on expeditions. The nature is uh, really like blooming all the time. It's very green. Uh, the landscape is nice. And all Azores are very different. Every island is very different. And I like Fayal because it's an older island, so the landscape is more soft. I use the scope from time to time because here I have a good view on the bay. And we have a lot of animals coming through here. I often see dolphins, uh, fish hunting, birds hunting. So it gives you a good idea of what's going on at sea, if the action is good. And also you can observe behaviors that you wouldn't see at sea necessarily because you have time to look at things. You can do like, you can check the group of dolphins hunting fish with birds. Uh, it's a good way to, to look it from outside. Uh, two days ago, uh, we had two uh, sperm whales, just like not even one mile offshore here. So it go gives you a good idea of the, the presence of the animals. And uh, then you can decide to, to go at sea and, uh, and trying to find them. But uh, it's a good way to, to scout uh, the, the whole area. 
I think I feel very good on land, uh, but I prefer to be on and in the water because there's so many things to do and that's what I love doing. When you dive with great white sharks, uh, a situation can switch very quickly, so you need to be aware of that. You need to be totally 100% honest with yourself and with the people you dive with. Uh, if you have any doubt, you have to call it off. So you have to read the animals very quickly because in two seconds, you can be dead. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's what I'm doing amongst humans and in the society. I'm very quick to understand how someone works. I'm always checking things. It's not being paranoid, it's just being aware of your surrounding. The nature of the place you live, sometimes you cannot have more, you have to, to be okay with less. But I think here in Azores, uh, if you go in the city or in the town, it's exactly the same as a big town. It's a small town, but it's the same. Uh, people want the same thing. They want a bigger house, they want a bigger car, they want a new car every five years if they can. I don't think here as I see more people that are very concerned about the environment uh, than somewhere else. Probably you won't like what I'm going to say, but I think there's no... Uh, we, we've passed the point of no return for the planet. Uh, that was probably 20, 25 years ago. So I think there's no turning back. Uh, even if we stop everything today, all uh, polluting activity, all CO2, everything, it will take 25 to 30 years before it stops evolving in a bad way. So it's totally impossible uh, unless we really decide to do it, but nobody's going to do it. But that's why I'm, I'm pessimistic and I see it in the ocean. I see the, the decrease of fish. Uh, the only thing that works is marine reserve. If they are enforced, if people are, you have uh, guards and police looking for it, then it works. But everything else doesn't work. Uh, the, the overfishing, the fishing. You know, in EU, uh, we always blame the, the Taiwanese and the, the Indonesian for the overfishing. But in Europe, we, we are terrible. Uh, you see the, the French fleet, the Spanish fleet and the Portuguese fleet. They only run by subsidies. If the EU was not giving them subsidies for the fuel and building the ship, they wouldn't be able to go at sea because it's not sustainable anymore. The amount of fish they catch wouldn't pay the cost. Sorry huh, if I killed uh, no, the no. mood. <laughs> <laughs>